So, title is self evident. Um, this marriage is still going on, so it's not over, but it's mostly done. Uh, so, people here know, I don't have to tell you at all, that both these uh, uh, subjects, relativity and uh, quantification, are the pillars of modern physics. And uh, they are the most, two most profound discoveries of the century. Uh, they are profound not just by standards of physics, but even by standards of any intellectual activity. As you know, people in many fields outside physics, whether they understand quantum mechanics and relativity or not, talk about relative and uncertainty and so on. So it's really widely and serious philosophers do serious work on these things. So these two very important pillars of physics are common back to much of the intellectual activity of the last century. And each of these was uh, constructed more or less fully uh, by 1930. So that is 80 years ago. Uh, special relativity was the earliest and it was done by 1905, the famous set of papers of Einstein. General relativity by 1912, and quantum mechanics by 1926 or so. Uh, the essential aspects of all these and many calculational tools were all ready by then. So, this is a long time ago. Nevertheless, whether they are compatible with each other is something that still what is going on in the last piece of the band. So, this is what we will talk about. And first question is why has it taken so long? These subjects were there in our textbooks, even when I was a student. And why has it taken so long for this combination of the two to take place? How is it that two very fundamental features of physical systems were each separately verified experimentally and used theoretically for all these years without constructing a single theoretical formalism that will incorporate both of the principles of both. Why did this happen? The reason is very simple. I mean, if you know, initially, as quantum mechanics and relativity were being constructed by their discoverers, it was to explain phenomena which seemed non-overlapping. Quantum mechanics was invented to cover certain phenomena. Relativity was invented to cover other phenomena. And it looked like these two phenomena are not intersecting, so that you, know, you really didn't have to combine both the place where you use one of them, you need the other, and you get vice versa. That is plain this. So the issue of whether they are compatible with each other was not so paramount. Wait, there are some seats here that you can squeeze in over there. Okay. Don't worry about getting stuck. Every half an hour I turn my back and <laughs> So, the main reason for their compatibility <coughs> with each other not being pursued seriously in the early days was because they were really not uh, thinking of using the both together. <coughs> so, later on, when the task was undertaken, it, it turned out to be quite so simple. So, well and one can. So, the purpose of this talk is to explain this. Uh, of course, for that, we have to give a little introduction to relativity, little introduction to quantum theory, which I will not give as an issue, because first of all, uh, each one of them, as you know, requires a four years course or more to explain properly, so people who don't know it, I simply cannot do it here. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, only the basic ideas and results will be needed, detailed, calculational things will be know it or remember it doesn't matter. Uh, you are familiar with them, at least quantum mechanics, I hope, or is it in your courses and some special relativity. In any event, you would have heard of any of these things already in your college days. So, except for quantum mechanics, you have to know a little bit more in detail. Relativity, you don't even have to know much other than what you read in popular science magazines for the purposes of this talk. 
So let's start with the with relativity, and in particular with the simpler part of relativity, the theory of special relativity. This was invented, as you all know, largely by Einstein. And it's a theory of how physics will appear to two different people, two different observers, who are moving at some uniform velocity with respect to each other. Yeah. Me standing there, you are going there at a uniform velocity with respect to me. Then how will the physics as the same phenomenon seen by him appear as compared to how it appears seen by me? That is the aim of the theory of relativity, relative motion, but limited to uniform velocity, constant velocity between the two. And in the process of doing this, the theory ended up demanding very radical changes in our concepts of space, time, and energy. It was not just a matter of fudging a few equations of Newtonian physics, you had to do complete overhaul of relativity. And as you all heard here and there, the absoluteness of time for me and the other development had to be abandoned. Time is something different for me as to them in detail. Simultaneity has no meaning, universal meaning, what is simultaneous for me may not be simultaneous for the other guy. And things like time dilation, something seems will seem longer to him than it does to me. Length contraction, foot rules, you know, it seems smaller to him. All these things are things that are there in special relativity which you would have heard about or you could study. We can't discuss them or prove them here, but I hope you've heard at least of these things. And they've all been experimentally verified. <coughs> and the most important part, I mean, the, uh, the, the proof of the, the real operational usefulness is the intrinsic convertibility of matter and energy. Of course, the equation E equal to mc squared only tells you that if you convert from matter to energy, how much energy you will get for a given mass m. The fact that there is an equation that doesn't mean it will happen, but it does happen. Matter does get converted. Was prompted by this equation. Now, the main motivating plan of Einstein's theory, the reason why Einstein did this, was to ensure that the velocity of light remains invariant for different observers. So, we're talking about me and the other person going at uniform velocity. I watch some beam of light, it has some velocity, and the velocity of light, he watches the same beam of light. But he's traveling competitively. Maybe he's chasing, going in the same direction, or going the opposite direction. So we normally expect the velocity of light for him will be more or less compared to me, as it would be if you were chasing a car on the road. But as you know, the famous Michelson Morley experiment and other evidence later on showed that this was not so. That light travels at the same speed for me and for him, who is moving at some velocity, regardless of the speed of his movement. And regardless of the direction of this velocity, as long as it's a uniform velocity, the velocity of light seen by all of us seem to be the same, experimentally formed to be the same. So this clearly cannot be wheeled out of ordinary Newtonian theory. Very simple t prime equals t, x prime equals x minus e t. To calculate the velocity of a third object, it will be different. It will be different as seen by me and as seen by you. But for the case of light, it didn't seem to be so in the real world. So we don't make funny theory just for the sake of making funny theory. It has to be forced on you by what happens in the real world, by experiment. And experiment showed whether you like it or not. Today you may like it because it may have been beautiful theory. At that time it was a nuisance. Then it was not. And it was showing that the velocity of light did not change, as seen by two different experiments. So Einstein had to worry about this. A responsible man had to find a way of ensuring construct a theory so that this fact is a fact. The fact of life was in fact satisfied by his theory. And he found that you had to abandon everything and construct a brand new type of theory with completely different notions, concepts, and ideas about space and about time and how in some ways they're interconvertible. Um, and the, the name space-time came out of all that. Internet is popular as well of people. So, it was not just a, that the speed of light remained the same in Einstein's theory, but for many other notions you had to abandon. And you gave them no more about this. Now, it's not important for this talk that you remember the derivation of the light transformation and so forth. You remember well and good. But if you remember these highlights, the most important thing to remember is that all these funny things 
like time, life of something in my frame is different from its life in your frame, that a foot rule is a ruler in my frame, to short in your frame, all these things, all these funny results I would say, unconventional results at that time, happen only at very high speed. That is the observer as compared to me, the other person with whom I'm comparing my observation has to move at a speed which is very high, comparable to the speed of light. Of course, special relativity theory didn't say the theory is valid only for speeds higher than 10,000 miles per second. No, it's valid all the time. It's valid for all speeds. Even if you're crawling at the speed of an ant, special theory of relativity holds in comparing the ant's observations with mine. But there, at low speeds, the answers are not very different from that of ordinary neutral mechanics from our day to day way we calculate relative velocity and so forth. It is only when you go to speeds which are relativistic, and by that I mean the speed between the, the different observables is comparable to the velocity of light, which is denoted by C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second approximately. But all these phenomena like time dilation, like contraction, lack of simultaneity, and all these become substantial, become, you know, uh, observably significant so that your instruments can measure. These effects, in fact, in quantitative sense, are proportional to the ratio of the velocity of the other frame and the velocity of light. So, if you're traveling at 1% of the velocity of light, these funny effects will be 1% square, 0.01%. So, until you go to that level of accuracies, you won't detect all this contraction of length, the change dilation of time, lack of simultaneity and so on, you won't detect it unless you go to the level of 0.01%. And that also is only when the other observer is going at 100th of the speed of light. If he's going at ordinary motor, motor car speeds, as you can see, the ratio will be very small, and the square of a small number is even small, smaller. So you don't expect to see relativistic effects in day-to-day -day life. Uh, that's why we didn't know that it was there, that's why people didn't discover it in ordinary life until somebody went into Light. So what makes Einstein's invention of special relativity very impressive is that physicists have no experience with things that move that fast. It's not as if things were moving very fast all the time in experiments or in Einstein's daily life when things were contracting and time was dilating and people were amazed why it was going on. None of this was available in day-to-day terrestrial -day life. It's only available in some peculiar experiment did by Michael Sennett Morley that to America. Those days why did things go on in America? Who knows? But it is the concept that brought out of Einstein and he discovered, constructed a whole theory, even though he didn't have the support of experimental observations of things moving really fast. So that is part of the man's genius, which was even more so in general relativity to which I will come later. So physicists have no experience with things that move at speeds close to the speed of light. One of the conclusions of Einstein's theory was nothing can move faster. The only things that can move at the speed of light, the lights itself or other zero mass particles. And all other things have to move at a speed which is less than the speed of light. And day to day life those days uh, contained, consisted of things which are much, much lower than the speed of light. So, physicists and ordinary people, and they also physicists, have no experience with things that move so fast. The only exception was light itself. Everybody knew light was moving fast. Uh, so, not surprisingly, it is right that became the central hero of the special relativity theory. And therefore, special relativity theory, with all its interesting ideas and concepts, really becomes important, important in the sense of being experimentally significant, where your answers will come out wrong, you don't use relativity. All that happens only when you're dealing with things that are moving at the speed of light, or sorry, close to the speed. So that is the domain of relativity, special relativity. We will compare it with the domain of quantum mechanics and look for a domain where both of them are needed for a long time, in fact, they are not. Let me then say a few words about general relativity. Now, in special relativity, very speaking, contributed a little piece of here and there. General relativity is entirely Einstein just sat in a corner and did it on his own. There was no experiment, nothing. He was just compared by uh, the notion of unity of conceptual unity and theoretical beauty. So what is general theory of relativity? Just like the special theory of relativity. Except that instead of relating the observations of two people 
closer, but moving at uniform velocity with respect to each other. It tries, to, it also relates it when one of the observers is accelerating with respect to the other one, where special relativity doesn't hold, never claims to hold, doesn't hold. And different things happen when something is accelerating with respect to as compared to when it's just moving at a uniform velocity. We already know that from ordinary, some of these, this, these notions we knew, because when you have a train, you know when you have a train going at uniform speed, plane is much better. You simply don't know the thing is moving uh, when it's really going smoothly. Whereas at the moment there is a little charka, you know, the plane drops a little bit, everybody knows it. So acceleration does do things which uniform velocity doesn't. That part everybody knew, but he related it to many other things that we see. Now general theory of relativity is mathematically much more complex than special theory of relativity. I expect many of you to have seen special theory to one level or the other or heard about it. General theory is really far too complicated. Uh, but fortunately, the effects of general theory, just like the effects of special relativity, become significant only at high speeds, and you don't have to worry too much about it if you are not at high speed. Similarly, general relativity becomes significantly significant only at tremendously high acceleration. Or very strong gravitation fields. And when general relativity was invented, again there were no systems of interest to physicists who were doing experiments for two, three hundred years, which really required the power of general relativity at all. So that people didn't know about it, it didn't bother them, it never came into play. So there was no need at all for construction of general relativity. Nobody told Einstein, we need this, please do something. He took it upon himself to do it, even though there was no experimental need for it at that time. Uh, so why did he spend seven years of his life extending special relativity to move the more complicated domain of accelerating systems? That was man's very intuition because he anticipated, he knew certain deep things are involved there, uh, and he knew that he would generate very profound new physics, and that's what happened. So he was driven by a desire to unify, but unify in a particular direction, which would be which are new profound concepts. And the profound consequences I have sort of listed below in yellow. Uh, there is a relationship between three things which over. Uh, one is gravity, which is our good old Newtonian gravity. We are all very familiar with it, because we're supposed to be familiar with as a force. Uh, two, accelerated frames. So if you go in a, if you are a person who's suffering an acceleration compared to me, you will feel a different gravitational force than me. That's the relationship between accelerated frames and gravity. This part we already know when I talked about the brain moving up and down. And the better example for that is the, well, I'll come to it now. And the other connection, which is a more difficult connection to understand, is that in fact the space time that we live in is curved. Now it's hard to understand even what that means. But for space you can understand it as the two dimensional space can be flat or it can be curved. Uh, the claim is that three-dimensional space-time is also a curve, and that curving has to do with gravity. That the curvature is equivalent to having gravity. And having gravity is equivalent to accelerated friction. So these things are all related to each other, was the deep inside of this theory. And for all this to be, again, of practical use, practical consequences, you need really very really strong gravity. For some, one of them, as I said, uh, we do understand the notion of acceleration and gravity being connected. We are all told this thing in my school days before satellites came that you know when you fall down an elevator and you drop a ball, the elevator goes on three fall, you and the ball will be standing there. Nobody who told me this ever said that he had done it, that you drop down an elevator with a ball. So you just had to imagine it, you could get up there. But now with satellites you have all seen this every other day when things are floating on the planet, satellite is accelerating centrifugal force, or the centrifugal, I don't know which one it is, one of them, is yeah, there, and you don't feel the force of gravity, things are floating out. So we have now seen enough of this, so it's no surprise at all. So being in an accelerated frame, objects in that frame will feel a different force of gravity. In the case of satellite, it is zero. 